Melanie Smith, date of birth, 1969. Classification, mass murderer. Characteristics, alcoholic, set fire to neighbor's home after long running argument. Number of victims, five. Date of murders, 19th of October, 2012. Date of arrest, the same day. Method of murder, fire. Location, Prestatin, Denbyshire, Wales, United Kingdom. Sentenced to life imprisonment, 30 years minimum, on May the 7th, 2013. Three children of murderer Melanie Smith have revealed the torture they suffered at their mother's hands growing up, whom they describe as the most evil woman in Britain. They revealed how Smith burned them with cigarettes, poured boiling water over them, and locked them in a tiny cupboard if they cried. She also chopped off their hair if they made too much noise. Their father, Paul, now 51, fought Smith for custody of the children, but lost. It was only when she abandoned them in voluntary foster care that he won them back and their ordeal ended. Her daughter told the Sunday Mirror, we all wish she was dead. Knowing that the evil woman who killed that poor family is our mother is almost impossible to bear. Dad rescued us from hell. He's brought us all up without her, but now she's back in our lives in the most horrific way imaginable. She's been dead to us since we were tiny. Now I just want her to rot in hell. Paul married Melanie in August 1987, two years after they met at Pontins near Prestatin, where she worked as a chambermaid. She gave birth to their three children within the next four years, but Paul said he immediately noticed she lacked any maternal instinct. As she began to drink more and more, Paul began to notice marks on the children, but Melanie always had an excuse. The final straw came when he discovered her in bed with another man while their three children were locked in another room. The couple divorced and Melanie won custody of the children, but put them into care a day later because she couldn't cope. Paul told the newspaper, When I picked the kids up from the foster home that day, I vowed that Melanie would never hurt them again. None of us ever saw or spoke to her again. She's never sent one birthday or Christmas card, and there's never been a single letter. Leanna Shears and Liam Timbrell had the downstairs neighbour from hell. The couple lived in an apartment in Prestatin, North Wales, with their 15-month-old son, Charlie. Below them lived Melanie Smith, a spiteful, evil, heavy drinker and all-round hell bitch. While Lee Anna Shears, Liam Timbrell and little Charlie were trying to go about their life peacefully and contentedly, Melanie Smith was doing her desperate best to make them frightened and miserable. Indeed, it seemed to be Melanie Smith's goal in life, aside from getting drunk, to make everyone she knew frightened and miserable. She had a long history of threatening violence and causing harm. Leanna Shears unfortunately became the latest target of Melanie Smith's brutal, drunken temper. There were, unsurprisingly, many targets over the years. In 2007, Melanie was barred from a hotel for being disruptive, and she threatened to burn it down. In 2012, Melanie Smith became convinced that her boyfriend was having an affair so she totally trashed his car and tried to burn down the woman's house. Mercifully, she was too drunk to ignite the matches that time. Melanie Smith decided on September the 1st, 2012, that she would make Leanna Shear's life hell. She accused the young mother of being noisy and untidy. She was apparently really annoyed about cigarette butts in the entryway and began threatening Leanna Shears that she would burn down the house with her and her family inside. Melanie Smith did not make her threats in secret. Oh no, she made it loud and clear to anyone who was within earshot. I will burn the house down with her and the kids in it. That seems to have been her mantra about anyone she was feuding with. She came up with the brilliant drunken plan. She didn't like her apartment or her neighbours or her landlord. So if she burned the place down, she'd be given a new place to live by the council. And so came the evil day, October the 19th, 2012, when Leanna Shears left her child's pushchair in the hallway. 
Leanna Shears wasn't home alone when Melanie Smith launched her evil attack. There was her little boy, Charlie, and there was Liam Timbrell in the apartment too. Tragically, her four-year-old nephew, Bailey Allen, and her two-year-old niece, Sky Allen, were visiting that day. The presence of people in the apartment didn't faze old Melly. In fact, it seemed to have increased her sense of excitement and her determination. She actually yelled to Leanna Shears and family from the street, I'm going to set fire to the house. She even yelled through the letterbox, I'm going to burn your house down. And then set fire to the pushchair in front of the door so that nobody in the apartment could escape. Liam Timbrell phoned 999 in a total panic. Oh my God, oh my God, we're going to die, he told the operator. Help, help. Someone has put it on purpose. We're inside the flat. I cannot imagine the sheer terror those parents and those little children felt as the flames and smoke overcame them. Leanna Shears, only twenty years old, died in the fire. Little Bailey and Skye died too. Firefighters managed to pull little Charlie and his dad from the flames, but they were horribly injured. Liam Timbrell was conscious and able to tell paramedics what had happened. It was Mel from downstairs, and Mel did it. Thanks to Liam Timbrell, investigators knew full well that Melanie Smith had purposefully set the building on fire, knowing her neighbours were inside. Liam Timbrell and little Charlie died of their injuries in hospital. Thanks to Liam Timbrell's statements to paramedics and on the 999 recording, Melanie Smith was brought to trial. In Mold Crown Court, she defended herself by calling 21 prosecution witnesses liars. Mr. Justice Griffith Williams summed everything up very well. He told Melanie Smith the setting fire to the pushchair was an act of exceptional wickedness, almost unparalleled in its consequences. For those who had to hear the evidence of the 999 calls, the horror of those moments in the flat upstairs as Leanna and Liam faced the awful inevitability of their imminent deaths will be forever etched on their memories. Understandably, the knowledge of the manner of their deaths has added to the overwhelming grief of their families, all the more to those who rushed to the house in the hope they could help. That grief will not have been mitigated by any meaningful remorse on your part. You continue to portray yourself as a victim, blinding yourself to the sufferings of the real victims in this case, and failing to at least acknowledge that it was your deliberate act which started the fire. And with that, Mr. Justice Griffith Williams sentenced Melanie Smith, 43, to an automatic life sentence, with no chance of release before 30 years. Joy Shears, Leanna's mother, said, Anna was such a lovely, bubbly girl, and Liam a very caring dad. Both of them were heroes because we know they would have done everything to rescue the children. The three kiddies loved each other. They played together all the time. They were our angels. Really, really nice people that will be missed. Peter Shears, Leanna's father, said, Nothing will bring them back, but justice has been served. Howard Hughes, born the 9th of June 1965, was born in Llandudno, Wales, to Gerald and Rene Hughes. He had three older sisters, and his father was a well-respected civil engineer and businessman operating a successful contracting and quarrying firm. 
Hughes was born with the sex chromosome abnormality XYY syndrome, which caused him to grow at an increased velocity, attaining 6 foot 1.829 meters by the age of 11 and 6 foot 8 inches 2.032 meters by adulthood. He also had behavioral problems, learning disabilities, and dyslexia. Hughes's father paid for him to attend private schools in the hope that they would be able to do something with him due to his often violent behavior, as he regularly lashed out at other pupils. When Hughes was rejected after just two terms by Lindisfarne College in Winstay, Wrexham, his father unsuccessfully offered to pay double the normal fees if they would keep him as a pupil. In 1975, age 10, Hughes was sent to Bank Hall, a residential school for educationally subnormal children in Chapel on Le Frith, Derbyshire. In 1979, he transferred to Woodlands Private School in Dagunwe, Wales. Despite his parents paying for extra private tuition, Hughes failed to gain any qualifications. One of his school contemporaries paints a vivid picture of Hughes the schoolboy. Even at school, he was seriously violent, he said. He was always in fights with people much older than him. Everyone was terrified of him. He was always killing things like small animals and birds. I saw him bullying people and he always used to carry a great big knife around. We had a lot of problems in Colwyn Bay in the early 80s when the mods and rockers had a revival and Howard was a mod wearing a parka and all that. As soon as any trouble broke out, Howard would be down there. He loved it. His increasingly worried parents took Hughes to a succession of psychiatrists and by the age of 11 he was sent to an approved school in Derbyshire. Mr Hughes said he was a strict father but denied ever using physical punishment on his son. The boy was a huge disappointment to him and in his teenage years was regularly in trouble with the police and being hauled before the juvenile courts. In 1981, when 16 years old, he took a seven-year-old boy into a derelict house where he exposed himself and made indecent suggestions before attempting to strangle his victim. The boy later recalled, He picked me off the ground and threw me down. He was a very strong man. He wound up astride me with both hands around my neck. The boy pretended to be dead until Hughes left. Finally, it was Mr Hughes who signed the assent form for his wayward son to be committed to St Andrew's Hospital Northampton under the Mental Health Act in 1981. While he was away, and perhaps partly because of the strain of dealing with their disturbed son, Mr and Mrs Hughes's 28-year marriage failed and the couple divorced in 1986. By the age of 19, Hughes had 17 convictions for crimes including assault, burglary, theft, criminal damage, threatening behaviour, motoring offences and possession of weapons. He received two custodial sentences before 1995. As a teenager, he served three months in a youth detention centre for the motoring offences. In the late 1980s, he served seven months in an adult prison for theft. Hughes had been accused of indecently assaulting girls aged three, five and nine. Police revealed that during the three years preceding the murder of Sophie Hook, they had interviewed him in connection with five allegations brought by or on behalf of children. In one case in 1986, the child's parents stopped the case to spare their daughter the ordeal of giving evidence. In the other cases, the charges were dropped by the Crown Prosecution Service because the victims were so young and could not have given reliable evidence. When Hughes was released from hospital after one year, he lived rough for a while around the Northampton area and was found basic accommodation by social workers before returning to Yerberg Avenue to live with his mother. Hughes, a child in a man's body according to his defence lawyers, struggled to hold down a job of any kind. Described as an out-of-work gardener by the time of his arrest, he was unable to keep a job even with his father's contracting firm. Mr. Hughes gave him jobs six times, but each attempt ended in failure, Howard playing the arrogant boss's son and refusing to work properly or to obey instructions from his foreman. For most of the time, Hughes was out of work, looked after by his affluent family as he drifted around the area, a brooding time bomb waiting to explode. Mr. Ashley Page, whose girlfriend lived a few doors from Hughes, said... I think it was only a matter of time before he did something like this. No one round here likes him and everyone would steer clear of him. He was scared of blokes, but he would have a go at women or children. My girlfriend says that several times she's been driving down the road and Howie has come out flashing V signs at her. Hughes would wear the same jeans for months on end and admitted during his trial that his teeth had rotted away because he could not be bothered to clean them. 
He continued to build up a long record which led to two custodial sentences. He gathered convictions for assaults, burglaries, thefts, criminal damage, threatening behaviour, and possessing a knife and an air rifle. His offences were mostly petty. One of his more recent convictions was for stealing 60 chocolate bars from a local supermarket. After one arrest, Mad Howard lived up to his nickname by leaping 25 feet from an upstairs police station window, suffering damage to his ankles which has caused him problems ever since. Mechanically minded like his father, Hughes had a passion for both real and model cars. A friend recalled that he had a Mini Mayfair, a Mini Highland, and an RS1600 Escort. He had a collection of vintage dinky model cars which he would spend hours polishing and which he kept in a case. He also had numerous toy soldiers and spent hours alone with his treasures in the garage of the house, listening to his stereo and playing with them. He shared the secret of his twisted sexual obsession with young girls with another convicted paedophile, Michael Weedy, 32, who was befriended by Hughes when he was 13 and stayed with him and his mother for three months from Christmas 1993 when he was homeless after coming out of prison. Weedy, who had to flee across the car park outside Chester Crown Court pursued by two men after giving evidence for the prosecution at the end of the first week of his trial, said Hughes confided to him his desire to have sex with a girl aged four or five. There was one occasion when we had a conversation and he said he would like to abduct a girl, have sex with her, and murder her, Weedy said, adding that Hughes planned to kill the child by strangling her or cutting her throat. On the 29th of July, 1995, Sophie Hook, aged seven, was visiting relatives in Llandudno, North Wales, with her family to celebrate her cousin's birthday. During the afternoon, Sophie stripped her underpants to play with the children in an inflatable pool in the garden. Hughes is believed to have observed the children, including Sophie, from a concealed point on a bridal path overlooking the property. Hughes was spotted in the area on his bicycle by several witnesses. He told one of them, a woman walking her dog who saw him crouching in the bushes, that he was looking for money that he had lost. From the bridal path, Hughes would have been able to overhear the children's conversations and was aware that they were planning to spend the night in a tent in the garden. Later that day, he is believed to have attempted to abduct six-year-old Alexandra Roberts who was doing handstands in a park less than four minutes cycle ride from the garden, but the girl ran away. At 12.20am on the 30th of July, one of the children decided to sleep in the house, although three others, including Sophie, stayed outdoors. Sophie's uncle, whose house it was, checked the children at 12.40am before retiring for the night, leaving the door open at the rear of the house in case any of them decided to come in. At 2.30am, Sophie's cousin woke, checked the time, and noticed that Sophie was still in the tent asleep between himself and her sister. At 2.55 a.m., Hughes was spoken to by a police officer who saw him while patrolling the town's promenade. When her cousin next woke at 7.15 a.m., he found Sophie was missing, her sleeping bag was on the grass outside, and her favorite cuddly toy was still inside the tent. Having failed to locate her after searching the garden and surrounding fields, she was reported missing to the police at 8.20 a.m., it is believed that Hughes had lifted Sophie, still asleep in her sleeping bag, from the tent at some time in the early hours of the 30th of July. Her naked body was found washed up on the beach half a mile away at Flandudno at 7.10am on the 30th of July 1995 by a local man walking his dog. Examination by Home Office pathologist Dr. Donald Waite revealed that she had been subjected to an attack involving considerable force, which had resulted in her right upper arm and ankle being broken, her body covered with bruises consistent with the gripping of the child by hand, and bruising around her head and face was consistent with punching or slapping. She had suffered internal bleeding and had been violently raped and sodomized. The majority of her injuries were comparable to those normally suffered by people killed or seriously injured in major car crashes. All of the injuries were sustained while she was still alive. Dr. Waite said that during the attack she had been in so much pain that she left teeth marks on both sides of her tongue and inside her lower lip. Death was caused by manual strangulation, lasting up to three minutes, after which her body had been thrown into the sea, probably an effort by her killer to wash away forensic evidence, near a cliff called the Little Orm at the eastern end of Llandudno's promenade. Her clothes, a distinctive pink and white Winnie the Pooh nightdress, knickers and a pair of Marks and Spencer socks embossed with pink flowers, were not found at the time. 
The murder inquiry was led by Detective Superintendent Eric Jones from North Wales Police. In a statement to the media, he said, Whoever was responsible for this crime is a very dangerous man, a brute who must be caught quickly. Hughes was arrested at the home he shared with his mother at 3.50pm on the same day that the body was discovered and detained at the police station in Rill Cluid to assist with their inquiries. On the morning of the 3rd of August 1995, the Crown Prosecution Service and police agreed that there was not enough evidence to charge Hughes with the murder of Sophie Hook, and he was released at 3pm that day, only to be re-arrested over possession of indecent images of children which had been found in a police search of his home. Within seven hours, he was charged with the murder of Sophie Hook, with a police statement citing that this development was on the basis of further information. He was remanded in custody to await trial the following year. After his arrest, police found pornographic equipment and literature at his home, much of it relating to children. He would cut out and keep pictures of children naked or in their underwear when he saw them in magazines and catalogues. He was obsessed with the shaved or hairless genitalia of women and prepubescent girls. In his police station confession, Hughes told his father that he had been sexually frustrated for 10 years, but in his incoherent and often angry evidence from the witness box, he claimed that he had last had sexual intercourse with a girl in Rill just four months before the murder. A metal foil container in a hole in the garden wall of his home contained eight recent indecent Polaroid photographs of a seven-year-old girl, and a compost heap on the other side of the wall contained a plastic bag containing three pairs of children's knickers, Hughes was to claim in court that he had found them while rummaging in skips. Hughes admitted in court that he took a fancy to little girls and had a total obsession with their private parts. When the news spread through his hometown of Colwyn Bay that he had been arrested for Sophie's murder, the reaction was one of shock and revulsion, but scarcely of surprise. He was a creepy kind of man, said the neighbour. For my kid's sake, I'm very relieved they've locked him up. Hughes went on trial at Chester Crown Court on the 24th of June 1996, charged with abduction, rape and murder. The jury heard no forensic evidence which linked Hughes to the death of Sophie Hook, but they received valuable information from three witnesses. Hughes's father, Gerald, told the jury that his son had admitted the murder to him shortly after he was arrested and being held in custody at a local police station, although Hughes himself has always denied that any such confession took place. Jonathan Carroll, a 30-year-old career criminal who was in prison at the time he testified, told the jury that he had seen Hughes carrying a hessian sack along a Llandudno street on the night of Sophie's murder, and that he had seen a glimpse of a naked body in the sack. Carroll himself admitted he was in the process of stealing property from the garden of a house when he saw this happening. A third witness, convicted child sex offender Michael Weedy, testified that Hughes had boasted to him a few years before that he would like to rape a girl of four or five. The jury also heard details of the injuries that Sophie had sustained in the attack, many of which had been inflicted before she died. On the 18th of July 1996, the jury returned a guilty verdict on all three charges against Howard Hughes. The 31-year-old was then given three life sentences by trial judge Mr Justice Curtis, who branded Hughes a fiend and recommended that he should never be released from prison. This provisionally placed him within the small group of prisoners who were issued with a whole life tariff, although the Home Office did not immediately confirm Hughes's tariff. On the 5th of September 1997, the Court of Appeal gave Howard Hughes leave to appeal against his conviction for the abduction, rape and murder of Sophie Hook. Six months later, he sparked further outrage by launching a £50,000 compensation claim against the Bryn Estyn Children's Home, where he claimed he was abused as a child. Two weeks later, the Court of Appeal rejected Hughes's bid to have his convictions quashed. Hughes's second appeal took place on the 4th of September 2001, but the Court of Appeal again decided that there were no grounds for his convictions to be quashed. The judges who made the decision also ruled that they would not allow Hughes to further contest his convictions unless any new evidence turned up. Hughes then reportedly decided to challenge his conviction in the European Court of Human Rights, but has so far yet to do this. On the 24th of November 2002, the then Home Secretary David Blunkett announced that four convicted child murderers would each spend a minimum of 50 years behind bars before being considered for parole. Howard Hughes was one of them. The others were Roy Whiting, Timothy Morse and Brett Tyler. This ruling meant that Hughes would not be considered for release until 2045 and the age of 80. 
The Home Secretary's power of setting minimum terms was stripped 48 hours later as a result of a successful legal challenge in the European Court of Human Rights by convicted double murderer Anthony Anderson. The Home Office described the timing of the Home Secretary's decision as coincidental in response to any media or legal sources which might have argued that Blunkett had made the decision as he knew he was on the verge of being stripped of these powers. The government was also under public scrutiny for failing to prevent a firefighter's strike at the time, and earlier that month, Myra Hindley had died after serving 36 years of her life sentence for her role in the Moors murders. Hindley's minimum sentence had been increased for 25 years to 30 years and then to whole life by a succession of home secretaries, and her supporters argued that successive home secretaries were keeping her in prison to serve the interests of their respective governments. Although Whiting had his tariff reduced to 40 years on appeal in June 2010, Hughes has yet to challenge the 50-year tariff, while Morse and Tyler have yet to challenge theirs as well.